Thank you for joining us for part one of our series, Species Distribution Modeling with Remote Sensing. My name is Amber McCullum, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Juan Torres Perez and Zach Benston. Before we get started with today's content, let's review the logistics. This series includes three one and a half hour sessions, and the two remaining sessions will be held on August 17th and August 19th at the same time, 12 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Recordings of each session of this series can be found on the training webpage. We've provided the link to the webpage here on the slide, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of each part. Um, but we're, if we're not able to get to your question, or if you have any other questions once the series is over, um, please feel free to email um, any of us at our email addresses shown here. Here's an overview of the three sessions for the training series. Today, we'll provide an overview of species distribution models. And next week, we will be joined by members of the Wallace team to discuss their modeling platform. And then during the final week, we'll discuss some additional species distribution modeling projects and tools. For today's session, we will first review the basics of SDMs. Then we will talk about the various components of SDMs that are used as inputs, such as environmental variables and occurrence data. Then we will review a few of the methods and corresponding models for running SDM calculations. We will then provide a few case study examples to really connect the dots of all of the inputs and the model types. Finally, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end, and um, do please feel free to type your questions in along the way as we go today, and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end. So first, let's begin with an overview of species distribution models, or SDMs. SDMs follow the ecological niche approach by assessing the suitability of a habitat for a species. They estimate the relationship between observed, in situ species and occurrences, and the environmental and or spatial characteristics of these locations. The models use raster-based layers, such as land cover, elevation, et cetera, as predictors of suitable habitat. The predictor data is combined with either presence and absence data or species abundance data in empirical statistical models. The figure on the right shows a typical conceptual model for an SDM, where your inputs are the point locations and the environmental or predictor variables. These are then run through a model, and then there's an output map of suitability generated. We'll come back to this conceptual model as we discuss each of these components throughout the session. Information on where species occur is an important component of conservation and management decisions. They provide a tool for mapping habitat and can produce credible, defensible, and repeatable information which inform decisions. There are many applications of SDMs, including mapping invasive species and establishing areas for mitigation or restoration activities, um, assessing the risk of species encroachment or decline for conservation planning through the identification of the most ideal habitats and corridors, to identify the best locations for ground-based monitoring, and to predict future habitats under a changing climate. The image on the top right displays a region that's been affected by a wildfire in southeastern Wyoming and where cheatgrass, seen in red, has been invading the region. The images on the bottom right show the USDA model outputs to develop a surveillance strategy for detection of emerald ash borer spread. So these are a few examples of those applications. As I mentioned, there are two primary types of inputs to the SDMs, the environmental variables, such as temperature or land cover, um, that are characteristics of suitable habitat for a particular species. 
Many of these environmental layers can be provided using remote sensing data. The environmental variables are then linked with occurrence data or known point locations where species have been found. Some models also use absence data, but this is a little more limited. This information is then fed into a statistical model, which is used to produce maps of habitat suitability. This can be based on past, current, or future scenarios. Here is a really important distinction about SDMs. They identify areas with environmental conditions similar to where species occur, which is based on numerical relationships. The output is the suitable habitat piece. They do not provide information on where species actually occur, and this can only be done through the ground-based data collection. There are always uncertainties associated with models and no model is perfect. So please keep this in mind when using SDMs. There are two primary types of SDMs, mechanistic SDMs, which are also known as process-based models or biophysical models. And these use independently derived information about a species physiology to develop a model of the environmental conditions under which the species could, can, could exist. We will not focus as much on these types of models during the training series. The other type, which we will focus more heavily on, are correlative SDMs, also known as climate envelope models, bioclimatic models, or resource selection function models. And these model the observed distribution of a species as a function of environmental conditions. SDMs can also be used to map current or past distributions of a species and the potential future distribution of a species. For the future scenario modeling, climate change metrics are needed, such as estimated shifts in temperature and precipitation. Here's an example of current distributions of forest types mapped in the Midwestern United States, um, shown here on the left, and the projected shifts to those regions under two different climate change emission scenarios, shown on the right. Okay, so now we will review some of the most common types of environmental variables used as inputs to the SDMs. As noted previously, these layer inputs go into the statistical model to assess how each variable influences the suitability, the suitability of habitat for a particular species. So here we'll take a look at these predictor variables. This is a list of typical environmental predictor variables, and it may not be the, the full gamut of every predictor variable you could use. But these include things like land cover, phenological shifts, vegetation indices and fractional cover, tree mortality, topography, and climatology. The climatological variables can be things like temperature and precipitation. Land cover is one of the most important variables when predicting species habitat. The type and health of vegetation are important drivers for biodiversity and can not only affect species distributions, but the entire ecological process. Changes to the land cover type, such as succession from oak woodland to savanna grassland, for example, will dramatically alter the flora and fauna present in these ecosystems. There are a wide variety of land cover maps available on a regional and global scale. So I'll discuss many of them today. However, I also make note that it's generally best practice to create your own land cover map when possible for your very specific region. Here's a list of some of the most popular land cover products, most of which are derived from remote sensing observations from satellites and sensors such as Landsat, MODIS, and Sentinel-2. These include US-based maps from the National Land Cover Database, the gap analysis, and from Landfire. Global products include the MODIS land cover product, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and from those from the European Space Agency. 
The Multi-Resolution Land Characteristics Consortium is a group of federal agencies who coordinate and generate consistent and relevant land cover information at the national scale for a wide variety of environmental land management and modeling applications. Maps of land cover, called the National Land Cover Database, are available for the lower 48, Hawaii, Alaska, and Puerto Rico. And these use primarily Landsat imagery as well as other supplementary data sets. Using the MRLC Interactive Viewer, you can see that there are additional data sets available for the US. These include layers for hydro hydrography, um, impervious surfaces, tree canopy, and ortho imagery. Here you can see the 2019 land cover layer. Using the data download feature, you can draw a bounding box and download data for things like tree canopy, land cover, and impervious surfaces. Uh, you can also enter your email and receive download instructions um, within about 24 hours of your request. The Gap Analysis Project, part of the United States Geological Survey, aims to address the question of how well are we protecting common plants and animals? GAP works to ensure that common species, those that are not officially endangered, remain common by identifying those species and plant communities that are not adequately, adequately represented in, in existing conservation lands. One of the primary products from GAP are land cover data, um, and these are available for the US. They also provide some species data and a protected areas layer. Another platform with available land cover maps for the US is LandFire, a landscape fire and resource management planning tool. And this is provided by the US Forest Service and the Department of the Interior. There are many data layers available on the data distribution site, including things like the existing vegetation type, which identifies plant communities via nature serves terrestrial ecological systems classification. And this is through 2016. These layers are mapped with models, field data, as well as Landsat. There are also layers of national vegetation classification, existing vegetation cover, vegetation height, and much more. And there are also um, disturbance map maps that can be related to um, wildland fires. Um, if you're more interested in this, please check out the um, RSET website for a recent fires training where we go into land fire in more depth. Now here are a few products that are available globally. The MODIS yearly land cover product incorporates six different classification schemes that describe land cover properties derived from observations spanning across a year. The primary classification scheme identifies 17 classes, which includes 11 natural vegetation classes, three developed land classes, and three non-vegetated land classes. The data have a spatial resolution of 500 meters, and currently the MODIS version 5 processing um, has ended, so the land cover is available um, all the way up to 2019. And you can download these data from NASA's Earth Data Search at the link shown here. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, or the FAO, produces national, regional, and global land cover maps prepared by different projects with the aim of providing a common reference structure for the comparison and integration of data for any generic land cover classification system. This ensures the ability to exchange land cover data. These data can be accessed via EarthMap, which is a free and open source, source tool to visualize, process, and analyze satellite imagery and global data sets. And these include things like climate, vegetation, fires, biodiversity, and many other topics. And you don't need any um, prior knowledge of, of GIS to use these um, maps. Through its climate change initiative, the European Space Agency produces annual global land cover time series data from 1992 to 2019. 
at a spatial resolution of 300 meters. The data included are 22 land cover classes, and this is based on the UN land cover classification system. You can visualize and download these data using the land cover viewer shown here. On the left, you can see the various land cover types, including percent cover of tree cover. And you can select the year you want at the top of the screen. And you can also get graphs that include things like vegetation greenness and seasonality. And you can download the data directly from this tool. Um, you can pull the data in as a CSV or download them as raster data in um, GIS ready formats. And finally, I wanted to mention that if you have the capability, creating your own land cover map is ideal. You could see there are many different land cover maps available, uh, some of them having different uh, vegetation classification schemes, and you're really the expert of your region. So um, it's always beneficial, and oftentimes the accuracy is increased when you have your own data of the region and you can create your own land cover map. Um, we've also just completed a training um, running land cover classification in Google Earth Engine, and we have some previous other RSET trainings about land cover classification. So do check those out if you'd like more information about that. Another variable that can be included in SDMs is fractional cover. And this refers to estimating the pr proportion of an area that is covered by each member of a predefined set of vegetation or land cover types. For mapping fractional cover, the proportions of the different classes will then sum to one. Fractional cover estima estimation requires that a land cover map is created ahead of time. Accordingly, the output of fractional cover estimation is an estimate of the proportion of each class for each pixel. So this provides a bit more insight into the ecosystem structure and the ability for the ecosystem to support a particular species. And this also has links to species movements and for mapping the extent of invasive species. Another variable that may affect species distributions, in particular for species that migrate or change locations throughout the year, is land surface phenology. This is the study of the timing of reoccurring plant and animal life cycles, or phenophases, and their relationship to environmental conditions. We also have a recent RSET training on phenology shown here. Vegetation indices are also useful inputs for SDMs. And these can indicate things like the relative density and health of vegetation with the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, for example, or a recently burned area with the Normalized Burn Ratio. Variations in these parameters can be critical for identifying suitable habitat for a particular species. Changes to the landscape can also greatly impact habitat suitability and corridors for species movement. If an area of tree mortality is large enough, it can be detected by satellites. In the image here, you can see um, mortality of lodgepole pine in Colorado due to the um, bark beetle epidemic. And there are multiple tools for visualizing and accessing data on tree mortality and vegetation disturbance such as the Global Forest Watch, USDA Insect Disease Survey, Land Trender, um, the Appears tool, and many more. Um, and we've also provided links to relevant RSET trainings on these topics as well. Land topography is a digital image of the three-dimensional structure of the Earth's surface. Shading indicates changes in slope or elevation. And the relief shading um, in a map comes mostly from ele elevation data. One place, a great place for elevation data um, is the space-based radar, the Shuttle radar, radar Topography Mission, or SRTM. And elevation is a useful marker of ecosystem extent and can be used to distinguish known species ranges 
within certain elevations. This can be of particular importance when estimating shifts in species distributions, such as movement to higher elevations as the result of climate change, um, like what we're seeing with the Plateau Pika shown here. The NASA Earth Observations Platform is uh, one location where you can access the SRTM data. Climate variables are another key data input to SDMs. Temperature and precipitation, for example, are key drivers of the ecological process and can substantially impact species ranges. These variables are usually provided as gridded estimates that are interpolated from climate stations. It's important to note that there will be increases in uncertainty in regions with less station data. These data are also the most important piece when conducting future species distribution scenario modeling, as they are subject to change under various potential future climates. So here are a few resources for accessing climate data, such as um, data from NOAA's Physical Sciences Laboratory and the NCAR Climate Data Guide, which has a variety of climate resources. Two of the most commonly used climate models are also PRISM and GridMet, and we've provided links to those here as well. One of my favorite places to access climate data is through Climate Engine. You can find data on things like precipitation, temperature, and many other variables from CHIRPS, MERA2, PRISM, and GridMet. You can also on the fly map making and figure generation of these data sets within the tool. And this is powered by Google Earth Engine. So it's, it's really um, all done on the cloud computing platform and it's really user friendly and no coding experience is needed with this tool, like with um, much of Google Earth Engine. The use of global climate models in predicting future species distributions can be challenging, but it's an important and popular type of research being conducted currently. This is of great importance as we aim to map species habitat and changes to those habitats under climate change. It's important to note, however, that there is increased uncertainty when conducting predictive modeling of species in future communities that do not exist at present or into a parameter space not encompassed by the original SDM. SDMs linked to future landscapes are most credible when focused on well-studied species within systems where the important parameters are understood. For most situations, it's best to consider these future models not as predictors, but as scenarios. Temperature forests excuse me, temperate forest communities are an excellent example of where SDMs are linked to climate models to project future communities. We also have a link to a previous RSET training that was uh, really focused on scenario modeling. A great resource for obtaining future climate projections is through the NASA Earth Exchange or NEX. Here you can access the downscaled climate projections data set for the US that are derived from the general circulation models. And these are available for the CMIT-5 um, and they also represent the, uh, provide the representative con concentration pathways or RCPs developed for the fifth assessment report. Um, and the link is shown here. So now we're going to move on to discussing species occurrence data and providing a few examples of where you can find occurrence data. So again, coming back to our conceptual model, it's vital to have point locations of species occurrence to pair with the environmental variables. Species distribution data may be presence only or presence and absence. Two contrasting examples are shown here. On the left, you can see Puma presence locations in the San Francisco and Monterey Bay region in yellow. And on the right, you can see a presence absence map for the Peregrine Falcon with presence test points in black, assumed presence in red, and assumed absence in gray. 
Depending on the model you're using, you may need absence data in addition to presence location. Absence of a species does not necessarily denote absence of suitable habitat. When it is repeatedly observed that a species is not present in a particular location, you can presume that it's truly absent. True absence points refer to locations where the environmental conditions are unsuitable for a species to survive. However, it's advised to really be careful with such conclusions. As for some species individuals, they may only be present in a, a particular location for a particular season, um, in particular if they're a migratory animal. In general, comprehensive surveys can supply true absence data when sites have been visited one or more times and, and folks have used high quality detection methods for suitable species. False absences can be identified if a species was not detected, even if it is present, or if the species was absent during the sampling time, um, even though the environment is suitable for that species. For example, to record true absence of a species that is not only active during the night, surveys should be carried out at night, and conclusions about absences cannot be drawn if sur surveys were only conducted during the daytime. Such surveys, however, are really time consuming and therefore true absence is hardly ever available for any particular species. So you, need, you may need to generate pseudo absence data, which is inferred absence based on information available about the presence location of a species. So this is a bit more complicated and requires um, some more thought and, and careful attention when using absence information. So I will now list a few resources for obtaining occurrence data. Um, for a couple of these tools, we're going to go in depth um, during session three. So for a few of them that we've listed on the website, come back for a, a much more in-depth description of them um, for our final session. The first tool I wanted to highlight here is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is an international network of data infrastructure funded by the world governments. And this is really aimed at providing anyone, anywhere, open ac access to all kinds of data about life on Earth. This network provides participants um, with common standards and open source tools that enables them to share uh, information of when and where a species has been recorded. They also use data standards such as the Darwin co Core, which forms the basis for the bulk of the data. Um, and they have hundreds of millions of species occurrence records. Publishers can provide open access to their data sets using uh, machine commons license designations. And this really allows um, many scientists and researchers to write a lot of uh, peer reviewed publications and policy papers um, every year. It's a really great network. iNaturalist is a relatively new source, and this is really powered by citizen science. In particular, this is a smartphone application that has led to a surge in contributed observations and now really accounts for a large percentage of new species occurrence observations. As a citizen scientist, you can connect with other observers, contribute to a specific project, and even hold field campaigns. And these observations are vetted for quality by experts. And iNaturalist also shares data with GBIF, the platform I just mentioned. MoveBank is an online platform that helps researchers and wildlife managers worldwide manage, share, analyze, and archive animal movement data. It's used by thousands of researchers and wildlife managers around the world. And um, MoveBank allows users to retain ownership of their data so they can choose whether or not they want to make it public. Um, the goals of MoveBank are really to archive animal movement data for future use, enable collaborations between researchers, students, conservation organizations, to help address new questions by combining data sets um, 
and looking at things like ecological patterns, evolutionary processes, um, to promote open access to animal movement, in particular when um, the data collection is publicly funded, and then finally to allow the public to explore these, these data and um, these movements recorded by animal trackers. Wildlife Insights allows for the collection, dissemination, and analysis of camera trap data globally. Anyone can upload their images to Wildlife Insights platform so that the species can be automatically identified using artificial intelligence. Um, this really saves thousands of hours of um, time for researchers going in to um, conduct these manually. Um, and by aggregating the images from around the world, um, we, it provides access to timely data needed to efficiently monitor wildlife. And we'll discuss this in more depth during session three. Map of Life, another tool we will highlight during session three, is a web platform geared for large biodiversity and environmental data. It supports effective and global biodiversity education, monitoring research, and decision-making by assembling and integrating a wide range of knowledge about species distributions and their dynamics. So there are many tools available on this platform to map species, to in explore environmental parameters, and to evaluate patterns. eBird is among the world's largest biodiversity-related science projects. And this has over 100 million bird sightings contributed annually by birders around the world. The goal here is to gather and share the bird information and in the form of checklists and um, provide it freely through um, these new data-driven approaches. Um, so very similar to many of these other um, tools as well. Um, eBird also allows you to see videos and hear recording of birds and see real-time maps of bird habitat. And you can also um, subscribe to a, an alerts to let you know when a particular bird species has been seen in your region. The Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System, or EDMAPS, is a web-based platform system for documenting invasive species and pe pest distribution in the US and Canada. It was launched in 2005 um, at the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health at the University of Georgia. It was originally designed as a tool for exotic pest plant councils to develop a more complete distribution of invasive species. Through this tool, participants can submit their observations or view results through interactive queries in the database. Participants can also manage their personal records and visualize data with interactive maps. And again, as many of the tools provide, the data is reviewed and verified prior to appearing on, um, on maps, and it's made freely available to everyone. Okay, so now let's talk more specifically about the statistical methods and their associated models that use these data. So again, coming back to our conceptual figure, these various models um, fit mathematical functions to describe species distributions in environmental space for each environmental variable used. They generate predictive maps of species distributions in geographic space using these functions. The extent to which such model data reflect real-world species distributions will depend on a number of factors, including the nature, complexity, and accuracy of the models, and the quality of the available data layers. Also, the availability of sufficient and reliable species distribution data as model input, and the influence of various factors, um, such as things like barriers to dispersal, geologic history, biotic interactions, um, that can increase the difference between the realized niche and the fundamental niche. So you may ask yourself questions like, how useful are the input data? Are they reliable? Are they adequate to meet the needs of the potential habitat identification? 
is it appropriate to assume equilibrium? A species is said to be at equilibrium with current environmental conditions if it occurs in all suitable areas while being absent from all unsuitable areas. The degree to which a species is at equilibrium depends both on biotic interactions and dispersal ability. You could also ask questions about your sampling. Are your samples adequate? The extent to which the observed occurrence records provide a sample of the environmental space and the period of interest are really important here. And finally, is, the, is this an appropriate model or suite of models to use? Oftentimes, multiple models are used and maps are compared against one another. When conducting your modeling, it's really important to keep in mind this idea of geographical space versus environmental space. Geographical space refers to the spatial location as commonly referenced using X and Y coordinates. Environmental space refers to Hutchinson's n-dimensional niche, and it's illustrated here for simplicity in two dimensions. The crosses represent observed species occurrence records. Gray shading in geographical space represents the species' actual distribution, such as those areas that are truly occupied by the species. Notice that in some areas of actual distribution, um, they may, might not be known, um, such as area A that is occupied, but the species has not been detected there. The gray area in environmental space re represents that part of the niche that is occupied by the species which is the occupied niche. Again, notice that the observed occurrence records may not identify the full extent of the occupied niche, such as the shaded areas immediately around label D does not include any um, of the known um, presence points. The solid line in environmental space depicts the species fundamental niche, which represents the full range of abiotic conditions within which the species is viable. In geographical space, the solid line depicts areas with abiotic conditions that fall within the fundamental niche, and this is known as the species potential distribution. Some regions of the potential distribution may not be inhabited by the species due to biotic interactions or dispersal limitations. For example, area B is environmentally suitable for the species, but is not part of the actual distribution, perhaps because the species has been unable to disperse across unsuitable, unsuitable environments to reach this area. Similarly, the non-shaded areas around label C is within the species potential distribution, but it is not inhabited, perhaps due to competition from another species. Thus, the non-shaded areas around label E identifies those parts of the fundamental niche that are unoccupied, for example, due to biotic interactions or geographical constraints. Notice that the diagram uses the same hypothetical cases as in the previous slide. A modeling technique, such as Maxent, which we'll discuss in a few slides, is used to characterize the species niche in environmental space by relating observed occurrence locations to a suite of environmental variables. Notice that in environmental space, the model may not identify the species occupied niche or the fundamental niche. Rather, the model identifies only that part of the niche defined by the observed records. When projected back into geographical space, the model will identify parts of the actual distribution and the potential distribution. So this is the ideal case uh, where the species of interest would be at equilibrium and we will have complete sampling of the environment. In such a case, the actual and potential distributions would be identical and we would expect to model both accurately. However, um, this is oftentimes not the case, and um, the model is maybe not very useful here because it's not providing those potential regions. 
In this case, we have a species at equilibrium but have poor sampling in geographic and environmental space. Here, the model identified part of the species um, actual distribution that's unknown. This type of prediction can be extremely useful for guiding field surveys since additional sampling will yield new species records. Note that there is not necessarily a direct relationship between sampling adequacy in geographical space and in environmental space. It's quite possible that poor sampling in geographical space could still result in good sampling in environmental space. For example, if a geographic area that has not been sampled has environmental conditions that are similar to those in an area that has, has been sampled, the sampling accuracy in environmental space will not be affected. So in this final case, the model identified an area of potential distribution that is environmentally similar to where the species has been observed, but where it is not inhabited. This type of prediction may be useful for identifying sites suitable for the reintroduction of things like endangered species, or identifying areas where a species may become invasive, or guiding field surveys towards the discovery of unknown species that may be closely related. Distribution models may therefore provide uh, they may be useful even in cases where the species equilibrium is low. So all of this is to say that we must be really cautious when interpreting model output, and we need to think about all these concepts when we are um, looking at those final maps. And uh, the main question here is to what degree have we, have we been able to capture the potential and or the actual distribution of the species? So with those concepts in mind, um, we're going to review just a few common methods and their associated models for species distribution. Um, in these slides, method refers to a statistical or machine learning technique. And then model or software name refers to the actual name of a given published model that implements that method. Um, so here we've listed um, three different methods, profile techniques, which uses environmental distance to a known site of occurrence. So how closely is a particular environment aligned with a known environment where the species is found? Two examples of this methodology are the use of the goer metric within the domain model and the ecological niche factor analysis within Biomapper. Regression-based techniques compare the relationship between the mean of the response variable and the explanatory variable. And these are things like general, general um, linear models. Machine learning algorithms are quite popular now. And as the model iterates many times over and over and learns from each modeling process, um, these types of models include GARP and Maxent. Okay, so with each of these models, we've also included examples and links to some papers that help explain them. So I do really encourage you to look towards those resources for more in-depth information. Um, the first one here, the Goer metric, uh, measures the distance that was first used in taxonomic classification. Um, but it can also be applied to a variety of fields, including this, this idea of distribution mapping. For each variable type, a particular distance metrics, metric that works well for that type is, um, is used, and then it is scaled to fall between zero and one. So then a linear combination using user-specified weights is created to, um, uh, is, is calculated to create that final distance matrix. The procedure computes potential distributions based on a range standardized point-to-point -point similarity metric and provides a simple, robust method for modeling potential distributions. The ecological niche factor analysis summarizes all variables into a few uncorrelated factors that explain the major part of species environmental distribution. It takes only presence data into account. Extracted factors are uncorrelated and have biological significance. The first factor is the marginality factor, 
which describes how far the species optimum is from the mean environmental profile in the study area. The second is the tolerance factor, which is sorted by decreasing amount of explained variance and describes how specialized the species is by reference to the available range of environments in the study area. An example of this is Biomapper, and this is a software that produces the habitat suitability maps. Here, a habitat suitability index, or HSI, of each cell is a value that's inversely proportional to that weighted mean distance of the cell to the median of each ENFA factor. Um, this value is then normalized in a way that the suitability index ranges from zero to one. Um, regression analysis is a technique used in many types of environmental analyses where linear models are used to establish the relationship between the mean of the response variable and the explanatory variable. In the case of generalized linear models, Multiple types of probability distributions can be used to categorize these relationships. For the generalized additive model, the functions are additive and the components are smoothed, which allows for complex relationships between the response and explanatory variables. So the, these complex relationships between um, the environmental factors that are um, useful in identifying the area where the species is present and um, then the, the area that the species is found. The genetic algorithm for rule set production, or GARP, is a type of machine learning algorithm that uses the ecological niche model approach to predict areas of suitable habitat for particular species. Um, this is really similar to the very first SDM created, um, BioClimb and it's produced by Environment Australia. And here, species abundance is determined by climatic limits, and some of the key assumptions are that biotic interactions are constant over space and time, and genetic and phenotype, phenotypic composition of species is constant over space and time. And then species are unlimited in their dispersal, or they will occur at all locations where the climate is variable, is, is favorable and nowhere else. Um, and this is an example here of um, one of those probability distributions for a map of bird species in the US. So finally, Maxent is probably one of the most popular models being used right now and is, is highly accurate for, especially for predictions of shifts in suitable ranges of species. It's also based on a machine learning response that is designed to make predictions of the potential distributions of a species from incomplete data. It explores the relative suitability of one place over another using the maximum entropy or randomness principle. It uses only presence points and is automatic and flexible. The model tries to have the highest likelihood and the smallest number of coefficients or the environmental variables. And Maxent will let you know which predictors are explaining the most variant, the most variance. Um, and then you can rerun Maxent multiple times for the final outputs. Maxent, however, is prone to overfitting, um, which can result in predicted distributions that are clustered around known um, presence locations. So given this, this, these descriptions of um, various methods and models, it's, it's really important to address limitations of SDMs. These include that all sampling data are incomplete and potentially biased. Predictor variables must capture distribution constraints. No single model works best for all species in all areas at all spatial scales over time. It's oftentimes a good idea to use many of these models and compare the outputs. And finally, the result of species distribution models should be treated like a hypothesis, and those should be tested and validated with additional sampling and modeling in an iterative process. 
Okay, so now that we've covered those major components of SDMs, I wanted to review a couple case study examples to really pull these concepts together and to align them with real world approaches and issues. Uh, these two case studies are examples provided from our NASA DEVELOP program, which is a 10-week internship where teams of participants use NASA Earth observations to address a natural resource management question with some partner agency. Um, so I've provided the links to the, the projects in each of these examples as well, and you can go there for more information about what these um, participants did. In this example, the team monitored mosquitoes in Europe. Uh, and the community concerns here were really that mos mosquitoes spread diseases such as Zika and malaria that kill over 1 million people a year. And due to rising temperatures, mosquito suitable habitat is expanding and mosquitoes are spreading to more temperate regions of the world like Western Europe. The main objective of this project was to lay the foundation for integrating multiple citizen science data sets and NASA Earth observations. The ultimate goal was to provide information about vector and vector-borne illness and make the data more publicly accessible. In order to accomplish this, the team explored three different methods of integrating and displaying mosquito habitat suitability on an open source platform. They also overlaid habitat suitability results with data such as transportation, population, and public health data that will all have um, an impact on mosquito habitats. The team identified several environmental factors that influence mosquito life cycle and population dispersion. And these include things like elevation, humidity, land surface temperature, vegetation health as measured through NDVI, precipitation, soil moisture, and land cover. And much of the environmental data was gathered um, from satellite um, systems, such as MODIS, um, GPM, SRTM. So you can see here that depending on your species of interest, there might be many layers that influence the habitat. And you might wanna take a look at a variety of um, data from different sensors. The team also obtained citizen science data consisting of geographic coordinates of mosquito presence points throughout, throughout the study area in Western Europe. Using a JavaScript code, the team called in the environmental data into Google Earth Engine and then took the monthly average for each environmental variable. Then the Maxent habitat suitability model was used and coded into Earth Engine and run for each month of the study period. This created map layers for each month showing the probability of mosquito presence. Again, I mentioned Maxent earlier. The team chose Maxent because the model is known to perform well with many of these different data sets. And um, it can be used with only presence points, which was available via the citizen science data. So the results from the habitat suitability model are shown here where the probability of mosquito activity um, is identified on a scale uh, from zero to one. And the color represents, uh, blue represents low mosquito likelihood and red represents high mosquito likelihood. And the team found that mosquito presence was positively correlated with NDVI, homogeneous land cover, and greenness and temperature. So these were the factors that were most useful within that model. The team also created an interactive map in Google Earth Engine that allows users to set a specific date, turn on and off these layers, and to access the map. Okay, so the second case study example um, we're moving away from the mosquitoes, and uh, this team focused on red spruce in West Virginia. And historically, the dominant uh, canopy cover um, in this region consisted of red spruce. However, extensive coal mining and logging combined with intense wildfires resulted in widespread conifer to hardwood transition. So red spruce restoration is of 
critical concern uh, in this region due to its ecological importance within West Virginia's forests. And red spruce also provides shelter and food for the Cheat Mountain salamander, the northern flying squirrel, and two other endangered species. Oh, these are two endangered species within this region. Additionally, red spruce stands facilitate soils that are more absorbent um, than those associated with hardwoods. Um, due to this, the soils are important for providing clean drinking water and for flood management. And um, the red spruce is also really important for sequestering carbon. So the goals here for the team were to identify the historical extent of red spruce from 1989 to 2018, to create maps of red spruce locations, and to forecast site suitability out to 2040. So this is an example of um, the use of the climate model and scenario modeling to um, assess potential suitability into the future. The team first used a suite of image derivatives to make stack, a stack composite as inputs to the machine learning classification tree analysis. And this was really to generate their land cover map. So you can see all the variables um, shown here, and then the team created this land cover map, which was one of the inputs to the, the distribution model. Next, the team created a change map over the six land cover classes using classifications from 1989 and 2018. So then you can see here on the, the right, this um, change from things like uh, change from red spruce to grass or um, urban areas or water. Now that the team identified where red spruce is, was, and could be, they use this information to find suitable habitats for red spruce. To do this, they used a fuzzy logic model. To put it simply, a fuzzy logic model works by transforming the raw values of the data inputs into a spectrum that ranges from zero to one. Values of zero represent pixels that are absolutely not suitable, while values of one represent pixels that are absolutely suitable for red spruce. So in this map on the right, you can see um, pixels that are representing the suitability from low suitability in red to very high suitability in darker green. The team determined that over a thousand hectares were suitable for um, restoration sites of the species as well. The final piece of this project was to use the land change modeler within Terraset to forecast where red spruce would emerge based on the data from the previous 30 years. The model shows regrowth growing into the periphery of the existing red spruce locations um, and areas of restoration that would uh, untie uh, or connect existing red spruce and create corridors of higher priority than um, areas that would not uh, connect the habitat. So connectivity potential was mapped in ArcGIS using the um, Euclidean distance between existing red spruce as well as the suitability of land between red spruce. So the team identified that active management would be necessary to assist red spruce in reclaiming the historical extent. So these two examples provide a more detailed picture of the types of modeling activities that can be conducted and how that relates to management of ecosystems. And there are so many more examples and applications out there, but this gives you an idea of really how everything pulls together and relates to um, potential management activities. So in summary for today, we reviewed a lot. We talked about how SDMs are used to assess the suitability of a habitat for a species. And we provided examples of environmental and occurrence data and tools for acquiring those data. We reviewed some popular methods and models for establishing these statistical relationships to generate the habitat suitability maps. It's important to note that there's no universal, universally uh, applicable method 
And it's really valuable to run multiple models to identify their most, if they're most useful to you in your particular species and your region. So all the methodologies must be adapted to the situation and to your research questions. Um, so I, I really um, want to stress that the, uh, the models that we reviewed, um, it's often a good time, a good idea to use multiple models to compare their effectiveness for your region in your um, particular study area for your particular species, because um, there are so many variables um, to think about. So um, with that, I would I, I invite you all to join us next week. We are going to be joined by some guest speakers who've created the Wallace tool to model species niches and distributions. And they'll be talking about their tool and giving a little demonstration of this tool, which is an R-based platform. So we're really excited about that. So please join us next week. And um, I want to thank you all for attending today. I would like to thank my um, co-trainers for our RSET program. Our email addresses are listed here. Um, again, I've listed the training webpage and the RSET website where we have a lot of other trainings available. You can also follow us on Twitter to hear about upcoming trainings. Um, and please use the training website for accessing the video recordings as well as the um, PowerPoint presentations for each of the sessions here. Um, so now we will go ahead and move in to the question and answer session. So thank you all. All right. Thanks everyone for attending today. Just give us a brief moment as we transfer over to the question and answer document. Um, I wanna take a brief moment to recognize our over 1500 attendees online today and um, the fact that we have a lot of questions. So uh, we certainly won't get to everyone's question. Um, we are uh, pulling all the questions, um, relevant questions and adding them to the Q&A document and we'll get through as many as we can um, online now. And then we'll come back to some of them and answer them on the document. And this document will be posted on the course website um, within about a week or two of the session. So if your question didn't get answered in real time, you can always come back to the training website and take a look at the Q&A document later. Um, and in, in that case too, if there are questions that I don't have the answer to right away, we'll come back and revisit those and provide you with resources as they are relevant. Um, if we don't get to your question um, today or later on in the document, uh, you can also email myself or my colleagues. Our email addresses were shown there um, on the, the presentation. I also, before we jump into the Q&A, I also wanna mention, we've included this text in the Q&A document, but um, for the next session on Tuesday, we will be joined by uh, some fabulous guest speakers who uh, created the Wallace model. And this is a SDM that you can run in um, R. And um, they will be demonstrating the, the model and talking you through it. And you don't necessarily need to work through um, their demonstration, but if you would like to, you can certainly um, download the Wallace uh, software and we've included instructions for installation on the course website. So do please take a look at that. If you're interested in applying Wallace for your work or you're interested in following along more closely next week, you can do that ahead of time, but it certainly is not a requirement. You could just follow along and, and um, go through uh, the training next week as they, they do it without this. But um, heads up that if you want to follow along, please do that before the next session on Tuesday. And as always, we will have the recordings of these sessions available at a later date. So if you want to come back to Wallace and download it later and work through it, you can come back and view the recordings of the um, uh, of the uh, each session at a later date. Okay, so uh, we will go ahead and jump right into our questions for today. A lot of good questions coming through. The first question asks, 
a really, it's a really important question, I think. Um, it, the, the question is how unique should the species environmental envelope be defined? In the case of tropical forests, where distribution is more or less the same for several species, how do you, ex how do you suggest species be differentiated? Um, and that's a great point. Uh, the environmental envelope for multiple species, especially in the tropics, will be similar. Um, and this envelope essentially delineates the area that has suitable habitat for a particular species. And multiple species might have similar suitable habitats, um, especially in these very um, biodiverse regions. So I would really suggest using extensive occurrence data for your particular species of interest um, and modeling uh, species independently of one another. So uh, running the model with um, particular occurrence data points for uh, particular different species within two different models and then, um, and then maybe taking a look at how their habitats align or don't align um, through those modeling efforts, but but doing this independent analysis of um, individual species and running through that whole modeling process independently might um, allow you to differentiate uh, these uh, species habitats, but it might not. The, the habitats might end up being the, the same range um, and that is just a function of, of the, the species and um, all of the, environmental variables. Um, I've also included here a uh, nice resource for more information on climate envelope modeling, which is this concept of um, the fact that you use these environmental variables for identifying species distributions. And, and also this ties into the effects of climate change and how species might be um, moving <laughs> or be uh, being available in different habitats as our climate changes. So do please take a look at that resource for more information. Okay, um, moving on to question two, if we can scroll down a bit. Thank you. For question two, like Maxent, which is also available inside Wallace, it's presence only. And how accurate is, is it compared to models which consider both presence and absence? Uh, is there any presence absence uh, model that has a similar um, GUI like Wallace? And that's another great point. We talked a little bit about this later on in the lecture for today, um, but there are some important caveats to think about when um, including absence in your models. Many of these models um, only require presence points but then take into consideration this concept of pseudo absence. Um, so uh, I've outlined a couple of those important considerations about absence data on slide 37. And there's also a great link to a paper um, that describes this idea of presence and absence and pseudo absence in more detail on slide 37. Um, and while I mentioned things like Maxen or, or GARP are referred to as presence only methods. Um, they actually require the use of the background data and they generate this sort of pseudo absence to run the model. Um, confirmed absences can often be very difficult to obtain, especially for species that are mobile or highly migratory um, that require higher levels of sampling effort um, to ensure that we're actually measuring true absence and not just uh, missing the species um, that may be there. So um, you're right, the, the models that require presence and absence tend to have um, to be a little more highly accurate, um, but do please take a look at this resource for more detailed information about um, those types of connections. It's, it's an important concept to keep in mind when you're conducting your modeling. Okay, question three. So for question three, this is a this is a great question that we get and it applies to a lot of different remote sensing applications. Um, not only just uh, species distribution modeling, but the question is, what are the best practices for handling environmental variables that have different resolutions? Um, so when you have different layers, 
of different resolutions, you always, and you're, you're pulling them together as layers within a model, you always want to make sure that you're looking at everything with the same resolution. So what does that mean? That means you have to either um, upscale or downscale. Um, oftentimes, the, the most approachable way to deal with these different resolutions is to upscale your finer resolution data to the most coarse data layer, um, which, which can be limiting if you have, you're essentially losing some of this valuable information in that really fine scale resolution data, um, but you need to have those to be matching up sort of when you're doing your modeling. So um, there are algorithms for both of these approaches. There are algorithms for upscaling and there are algorithms for downscaling. This is a very um, detailed process um, that gets a little beyond the scope here, but essentially you're going to want to regrid your data to conduct the comparisons of both data sets at the same resolution. Um, and uh, I've included here a resource for upscaling. Um, there are many, many resources for downscaling, like bias correction um, and many, many other things you can do with remote sensing data. It's a whole field of research out there. Um, I also found this rescaling function in ArcGIS, which I know a lot of folks don't use Arc because it is a private software. Um, and it's not something I've used in particular, but it seems like a promising method for um, a quick approach at um, rescaling. And I'm sure there are rescaling functions within things like R and QGIS as well. Um, so do please keep that in mind um, when, when conducting um, the, these modeling efforts, especially when you're pulling in a variety of different climate um, environmental data layers. Okay, um, moving on to question four. And question four um, asks about um, the MRLC or some variation of MRLC in other countries. Um, and I, I believe my, my colleague Zach answered this, this one, but I'll just go ahead and, and talk through this. We uh, first in the lecture, we talked about land cover data that were available only for the US. Um, there are many resources for the US, but then we also mentioned some resources that are available globally. Um, the European Space Agency has a lot of really great resources. Um, they have um, their land cover product that's available, um, I believe on a yearly basis. And we've included the, um, the link to the land cover product that um, from the European Space Agency. Um, there are also other resources that are available um, on a global scale, like um, Mod the MODIS land cover product, it's it's at a little coarser spatial resolution than some of the um, U.S.-based products. Um, but but do please take a look at some of those, and we provided those um, a little bit later on in um, the the land cover uh, portion of the lecture today. We we should have links to where you can find some of those resources as well. Um, on a on a global scale, and then I, I also will mention that land cover is um, is oftentimes really unique to your region. And while these global land cover products are a great first resource for sort of identifying the um, broad scale uh, different types of land cover, there may be a lot of uh, uncertainty in your specific region um, because uh, this is done on such a large scale um, th there may be there may be some uncertainties or um, it, they may not be as accurate in your region so I really do recommend conducting your own land cover analysis for your region especially if you have uh, ground-based data um, of land cover types uh, in your area because your local knowledge of the region is always going to be um, more beneficial when generating a land cover map than um, these global models. So um, do please consider that too when you're um, developing the input layers for your modeling efforts. 
Um, we just had a training um, using Google Earth Engine for uh, generating land cover mapping and doing things like time series analysis. Um, so do please check back on the RSET website for that training, and we've included a link to that uh, in the lecture slides as well. Okay, um, moving on to question five. Uh, this is a really good question. Um, and the, the question is, is it possible to do um, SDM with few occurrence data, like species lo location data with less than 10? And in general, um, a good rule of thumb is the more the better when it comes to presence points, right? We, um, we really want to get the full breadth of that distribution across space and time. Um, we talked a, a little bit about how to deal with inadequacy in, um, in sampling in um, you know, geographic or environmental space, right? We talked about that a little later in the lecture. Um, but some of these models, um, in particular Maxent, I think can, be, uh, can work successfully with few data points, um, such as 10 to 15 presence points. Um, but we also did talk about all of these resources available um, where scientists are sharing their data, where citizen scientists are getting involved. Um, so I would also recommend checking out um, things like GBIF, the um, uh, resource there for more uh, presence locations of your particular species. There are um, many, many resources available if you're limited in, um, in your, your data. So I, I would recommend taking a look at some of those resources that may um, benefit um, your modeling efforts. And, and I would say that it, it might be useful to uh, uh, run your model with your fewer presence points. Um, if you can find other um, occurrence data from some of these other portals or resources, pull those in, run the model again, evaluate the results. Um, as with, with all of these models and methods, um, conducting multiple modeling efforts with multiple um, models and then doing comparative analysis of the results is 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 also recommended um, because one model or or input layer might be more useful than another um, and also identifying um, sort of how well the input layers are um, modeling the variance across the 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 um, across the models is is useful too how valuable is it are each input layer um, in the modeling process. For example, things like topography might be more valuable than temperature um, for certain species. Um, and you all are going to be the expert in your species of interest that you're modeling. So you might have some idea of, of um, the value of some of these layers. But, but certainly, the more presence points, the better. OK, moving on to question six. Uh, how authentic are the species distribution records on um, GBIF? How are these data recorder, recorded? That's a great question. And there's a, a whole lot of resources on their website about this, um, about how the um, data are collected, um, how researchers and citizen scientists are inputting their data. There's a strict set of data standards um, for applying uh, these rules and also for sharing data across um, different users. So um, it is important to note that the recording um, of these data come from thousands of data sets across many, many institutions around the world. Um, but they've adapted this idea of the Darwin Core Standard for um, compiling their biodiversity data from these varied sources. And um, depending on how much information or essentially metadata there are about the inputs, um, the publishers can um, archive the data within three of these, what they call cores. And that's the taxon core, the occurrence core, and the event core. Um, and so, uh, these protocols are very, very detailed within the, the sampling and um, re regime here when you're uploading and including your data um, into, into the um, portal. So uh, 
so I think that you can have a, uh, you can feel pretty confident in uh, the data that are available um, and you can look in more in depth with your, each of the occurrence um, data sets available and um, who they were uploaded uh, by and how they did this their um, classification and um, sort of metadata analysis of, of their occurrence information. And I've included the link there for the standards um, if you'd like more information about that as well. Okay, um, moving on to question seven. Ah, this kind of gets uh, gets to what I was talking about um, the input layers earlier. So question seven is how many environmental variables should I use? How would I know if my environmental variables or data points for each variable are sufficient? Um, and I think that my, my colleague Zach helped me out answer this one a little bit. Um, but this will largely depend on your species of interest and the complexity of the environment that you're interested in. Um, generally, as a starting point, gathering as much um, information as possible and um, sort of throwing all of that at the model as an initial starting point is a, is a great option. And then what you can do is you can slowly uh, pull out different environmental layers or evaluate um, how much of the variability um, is being captured by each layer within the model. So essentially an, an evaluation of the strength of each layer within the model and how valuable is it for identifying the species range. So you can do this by um, inputting different variables, running the analysis, maybe something like a principal component analysis to identify the strength of each of your, your layers and, and how they are affecting the model output, and then evaluating that on a stepwise basis. Um, oftentimes, you know, then we get to the, the, the concept of, of um, Occam's razor and uh, sometimes the simplest model is the most effective model. And sometimes you don't need all of these additional layers to, to really get a, an effective output of your species distribution. So, um, you know, the strength of one data can oftentimes offset the weakness of another. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to address this question um, without a really uh, uh, complex uh, knowledge of the species that you're interested in. Um, you know, as the, the ecologist, you're going to understand things about the species range, the, the species habitat, things like elevation, the temperature range under which the, that particular species likes to live, um, their migratory patterns. It's something we'll talk a lot about in session three with some of the additional tools um, available. But um, also, you know, doing this accuracy assessment of your models is really, really important. Um, and then we'll talk about this a little bit more um, with the Wallace team next week and then, or yeah, on Tuesday and then um, in the final session on Thursday of next week as well. Okay, moving on <clears throat> to question eight, how to evaluate sampling adequacy? Is there any method to quantify uncertainty of the presence and absence data? Um, again, another really great, great question. Sampling adequacy is um, a, a real important piece of this. Um, and there, there can be a lot of bias in occurrence data. When you think about the ability to collect the field data under certain conditions, um, for example, there may be a bias of data collection in the field along um, certain trails or uh, pathways that are easier for us to get to get to, maybe at lower elevations in less complex terrain. Um, there, there definitely will be will be some bias in your data um, depending on how complex the environment is. Um, in, and, and it's also really important to remember, we talk a lot about this when modeling, is all models are wrong in some way, shape, or form, but they can be really useful, right? So keeping that in mind, 
um, when, when thinking about this. Uh, there are a variety of methods for evaluating how, uh, how well your model is working. Um, things like the AUC or just the correlation. Um, AUC evaluates how well model predictions discriminate between locations where observations are present and absent. And it's one of the most widely used um, sort of independent evaluators of model, model discriminatory discriminatory power. Um, you can also look at things like standard deviation within the distributions of your model um, to assess the presence and absence data. Um, uh, you know, another really simple thing to do is um, to run your model with a smaller number of presence points and then evaluate the accuracy. Add in a few, no few more presence points in different locations, evaluate the accuracy. Um, then you could start to see how the sample size of your occurrence data may really influence the output of your model and its ability to accurately model a um, distribution of a species in um, space and time. Okay, so moving on here to question nine. Question nine asks, how do you reconcile the mismatch between satellite measurements, like temperature and in-situ measurements? I see most SDMs relying on satellite data, but haven't seen some accounting for these sources of error. That's a really great question as well, um, especially when thinking about resolution. It kind of goes back to that previous question we discussed about scaling. Um, all of the satellite products that you're that you would be using do go through some kind of quality control step. And with most of the satellite data, you can always um, download the, the, the quality control file. And this will oftentimes include flags of pixels that we're uncertain of the, the value or where there's something wonky going on, whether it be in uh, the reflectance value or in the um, the calibration of the sensor, the angle of the sensor in space. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, and, and many of the products will, will provide some kind of disclaimer of what the potential sources of error could be. Um, and these can have a really wide range. Um, the errors can be a sensor error, they could be um, an issue with um, atmospheric conditions. So that's another big source of uncertainty when looking at, say, reflectance values or um, temperature values within a satellite product is how much is the atmosphere influencing the values. There's oftentimes uh, things like an atmospheric correction done um, to the layers prior to um, dissemination. Um, there are a lot of algorithms that are applied to the data for quality control assurance before they get out um, to the, the public. So um, again, just look into the specifics with each of your um, data layers that you're interested in terms of the source of error, how accurate they are, um, and, and include those caveats when, when running your models. Um, you know, in, in a lot of the outputs that you'll, you'll generate, you might have a pretty coarse resolution of the, the area over which a species could be located, the suitable habitat for a species, where the, the ground-based information is going to be um, much more finer in detail. Um, but those are assumptions that you have to deal with and you have to, to make and just be explicit and clear about when um, generating your output maps. That's a really good question. Okay, um, we are just about time here. at time here. I'll go through one more question. I know we haven't gotten to many, um, but we will uh, go through and answer some of these other questions at a later point and post them on the website here. But um, I think this question is really valuable. So I think we'll, we'll get to this one final question 10 and then we'll end for today. Um, so in the case of big migratory animals like elephants, they tend to uh, adopt forest trails for ease of movement, which may lead to overabundance of presence data near trail areas, and the model may show false distribution patterns. 
can this and other various behavioral tendencies be incorporated while designing the model? Such a good point. Um, and and the movement of um, the animals, especially with these migratory, big migratory um, animals like birds and elephants, um, it's really important to consider that when, when conducting your modeling. And we'll talk um, quite a bit about this in session three, um, when we talk about this idea of um, circuit theory and um, modeling uh, uh, the flow of species along things like uh, trails and migratory patterns. And um, one of the tools we'll talk about, a tool called CircuitScape, uses this idea of circuit theory and the creation of resistance layers to identify uh, potential barriers to movement for animals. So these different resistance layers can, um, they essentially generate weights that can um, identify uh, areas that are more susceptible to movement within uh, for species or less susceptible. So um, the resistance, will essentially be higher in regions that are more difficult for the species to move. Um, so these might be really high elevation regions, they may be complex terrain, and the resistance will be lower um, in regions like their trails that they're following along, right? So you can add in these resistance layers and assign weights to the um, terrain um, to model this appropriately of how a species will move and what that means for the species habitat and the, the distribution of the species. And also um, thinking about timing of, of the species. And, and, you know, we talked a little bit about phenology and how um, um, different animals move uh, to places to get food sources at different times of the year. And, and that is also something that you could include in your modeling effort. Um, but yeah, modeling migratory animals is a, another layer that's it's a really, really interesting concept. And we'll talk a lot about that um, during the, the circuits scape portion of session three. So, so do join us, um, come back for, for more info on that with session three. Um, so I, I just wanna, take a moment to thank everyone for being here today. Um, thousands of people online from around the world. It's so great to see you all here with us and to have such an interest in the work that we're, we're doing um, and, and really recognizing that community. So thank you again, everyone for being with us today. Do please join us for our second and third sessions of this training series next Tuesday and Thursday. Um, so thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone.